Hey everyone, and welcome to Chef AJ Live. I'm your host, Chef AJ, and this is where I introduce you to amazing people like you who are doing great things in the world that I think you should know about. Well, we continue today with Cheek Week. That is when Robert Cheek, who is the New York Times bestselling author of the wonderful book called The Plant-Based Athlete, is interviewing the most elite vegan athletes in the world. And I'm so excited about today's guest because I've been vegan for over 45 years. And people always say to me, where do you get your protein? You know, I mean, I can't lift weights. I can't be strong without meat. And I'm like, well, yeah, that's really interesting because the world's strongest man is vegan and he's here today. Please welcome back Robert Cheek. Thank you, Chef AJ. It is so great to be back here on the Cheek Week or the Plant-Based Athlete Week, whichever one you like. I love and Cheek I Week. I just, you have the best name, Robert. What can I tell you? And you're such a great host. And, and it's amazing the company you keep that you were able to get such elite world-class athletes for us this week. Oh, uh, well, thanks, Chef AJ. I just turned the other cheek. It's all good. <laughs> so I am honored to be here today with Patrick Baboumian. Patrick is an incredible guy. We, we've had the chance to meet in person. You know him from the Game Changers fame, but he was already well known before that as Germany's strongest man and competing in world strength, strongman competitions, even setting Guinness world records. So Patrick, it is an honor to see you. How are you today? I'm great, man. Just let, let's just uh, put one, one thing straight because there, there was a little a uh, little misinformation uh, there, and I, I, I don't want to let that um, stand. So I'm not the world's strongest man, right? I'm uh, when I was competing, I was pretty strong, but the world's strongest man is is uh, basically an official title, and I never had that title. Uh, but you know, as you correctly said, I, I have several uh, world records that I set as a uh, as a vegan, um, and um, yeah, I was pretty successful um, nationally and internationally as a strongman. Um, before I went vegan, uh, and then when I went vegan, I actually got even, I would say my, my success and especially my strength numbers actually got even better. So, um, thank you so much for being on the show and sorry for, for interrupting. <laughs> oh no, it's okay. I get that all the time, Patrick. I was an amateur bodybuilder. People call me a professional bodybuilder. People tell me Arnold Schwarzenegger is vegan, you know, because he's in the game changers. He's, he's yeah, obviously yeah. not a philosophical vegan <laughs> that, that, that abides by an ethics philosophy. But uh, so thank you for clearing that up because I know people do refer to you sometimes as the, the strongest man in the world that, you know, the strongest man in the world is vegan, but you certainly are one of the strongest people on planet earth. And I want to talk about that, Patrick, because you uh, unfortunately uh, endured some tragedy early on in your life, which I believe led you to this point to being this, this individual who was one of the strongest people on the planet who earned your way to set some world records to make a name for yourself, to have an impact for animals and the planet and all the stuff you're doing right now with your comic book, your world tour speaking, and obviously your major role in the Game Changers as one of the main athletes profiled in that film, which is one of the, the, the most watched documentaries in history, as I've been told. So if you don't mind, can you talk about that a little bit, about what led you to this point? Because I know it, it was a dramatic change in your life. Yeah, so it, it was actually a whole slew of uh, um, of circumstances um, that, uh, that 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 just happened when I was uh, very young. So um, I think maybe the central one was um, that I lost my dad pretty early on uh, in a car accident, um, and that meant that my mom, who was very young at that uh, point, so she was just in in her mid twenties, early mid twenties. Um, she basically had to go and, you know, just, just um, work to pay the bills. Um, and I was um, mainly with my grandma. So so that was a lot of chaos. And uh, of course, uh, as, as a four year old, uh, I have to say, um, you're not really emotionally um, like um, I cannot say that I emotionally uh, got the full impact of, you know, losing a parent that you would probably get in, in an older age because, you know, you, you're just very much um, uh, immature em, uh, emotionally. But um, that was just one part of, 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 of the things that were happening to me. So when, when I was born, for instance, there was also a war that broke out with the neighboring country. So um, until my seventh uh, uh, until I was seven years old, um, I, I basically grew up in war. So um, what all of that did to me is uh, it kind of gave me a feeling of um, helplessness. 
So, I mean, as, as a child, you, <laughs> you have good reason to feel helpless anyways, because basically the adults are in control and you just pretty much have to do whatever they say. And, you know, so, so you, you already feel kind of uh, powerless as a child anyways. Uh, but um, those things that, that, that were happening to me just gave me way more of, uh, of a feeling that I was not in control of, you know, what was happening to my life. And, um, um, and I, so in, in, in order to, to be able to um, kind of process all that and, and be able to get through that, um, I just built kind of a fantasy world uh, for myself. So I just, um, I, I was reading comic books and I was watching, you know, um, uh, animated series of, of uh, different Marvel uh, franchises in, um, in TV. So, so that kind of became my fantasy world. So, um, and one of my first encounters with a, with a superhero was the Hulk. So uh, I'm, I'm drinking out of a Hulk mug here, by the way. <laughs> so, so, um, and, um, and I think that was uh, really um, where where I got my fascination for strength, and uh, especially back then there was the Hulk TV series with Lou Ferrigno, um, who you know back then was uh, you know one, one of the best bodybuilders in the world, um, and and that was the first time <laughs> in a very early age that I got in contact with hypermuscular uh, you know male bodies basically, and I got fascinated by it, and uh, it kind of became almost like a you know like escape for me to um you know fantasize to be a part of that fantasy world where i would you know imagine myself to be um um you know super powerful myself and then i would for instance like you know um my 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 dad died uh, in a traffic accident so i often had this fantasy of where if if something terrible would happen in traffic if I would be super powerful, like the Hulk, for instance, that I'm, I could just go in and help people. Like if somebody would get trapped, I, I, I would be able to kind of, you know, get them out of harm's way by just lifting the car and throwing it away or something. Um, and it is kind of funny, like in, in the game changers, they're actually, um, the way they, they edited it is uh, that, <laughs> that while I was speaking about that, they showed me actually flip a car. Uh, which that was, you know, that connection was something that I never really thought about. But yeah, it is funny that I became an athlete who was actually able to flip a car. So basically, if if somebody would get hurt, I would probably be, you know, um, most qualified in, in in the crowd to go in and, and try to try to do something about it. So um, yeah, that you could say I built that fantasy world for for myself as as kind of a you know mechanism of escapism or something but I also kind of manifested it into my life so I, I kind of became what I was fantasizing about uh, what I wanted to be as a as a child I mean I'm not a superhero but um, I probably as, as a normal human being I'm as close as you can get to that <laughs> Well, Patrick, I think many people would disagree and they would say you are a superhero. You've been a superhero <laughs> for animals for a long time. We're going to talk about that in a little bit. You've been a superhero for people who want to believe in themselves and understand that they too can get big and strong. You've been a superhero in the fact that, in my opinion, that scene in The Game Changers was one of the most compelling and, and emotional parts of the whole film. I, I really, really enjoyed that. Um, that storytelling that is from your real life, that they put that flipping of the car in there. It just was a, a really powerful thing uh, for me to experience. And I know it was for, for many other people. And uh, you've been traveling around the world for a long time. In fact, I was just taking some mental notes before uh, we did this interview. And you and I both spoke in China. I missed you there. You and I both spoke in London. I missed you there. You and I both spoke in Toronto, where you where you set records and, and filming. I missed you there. I missed you by one day in Las Vegas. <laughs> uh, and my friend was filming your talk that when I was already back home. And then recently I was at the Colorado Veg Fest a couple of weeks ago, and people saw me and they were asking about you because you spoke there too. <laughs> and that's just a few cities that I can think of. I'm sure we cross paths many other places. Yeah. So what has that, what has that been like to have this dream, 
you wanted to get, you wanted to be a superhero. And by the way, I, I have a similar story. I wanted to be He-Man. I wanted to be Captain Planet. I wanted to make a difference for people and help others. And, and that turned into wanting to help animals. What has that been like for you just on a personal and emotional level to say, you know, this is something that I'm inspired by the Hulk and Lou Ferrigno and comic books to get bigger and stronger and then to actually do it and get recognized on a world stage where you, you've even given a TED talk about this. Like, what does that feel like? Uh, I must say it's, it's kind of funny because um, the whole connection of all of that was not really something like while I was competing and while I was basically living almost a life that was a fantasy when I was a child, I was not really aware of it, to be honest. Um, it, it only basically, I, I only connected the dots after the fact, after I had won the title and I had become a, a vegan activist. And um, at some point people started asking me um, what my motivation was. <laughs> and I kind of had to go into myself and ask myself the question, okay, what was it? Because it is kind of crazy to, you know, um, strongman, um, when, when I started uh, competing, uh, and even today is, is a very exotic sport. Basically, it is not something that is very mainstream. Um, and then within strongman, to be a vegan is like completely unheard of. Um, it, it, unfortunately, even today, like uh, today, compared to 10 years ago when I, when I went vegan, uh, there are way more vegan strength athletes. Like there are some athletes that I'm that I have so much respect for um, and, and they don't get the attention that they should actually get. Uh, and I find what, what they're doing like way more uh, impressive than, uh, than, than my own stuff uh, that I've done while I was competing. But, um, but there's still no like um, super high level strongman or, or there, it's not like there are like tons of strongmen who, who are vegan. And I think it has a lot to do with, you know, veganism is a subgroup of, of the population that is fa fairly small. Uh, and then strongmen is super exotic too. So if you have two very specific, small, exotic groups, the overlap is going to be very rare. So, um, but I'm working on that, by the way. I cannot, like, there, there is right now something happening in the background that is absolutely insane. Um, and it's basically, it, it's, it, it looks like another dream can, uh, could come true for me because, you know, one dream of mine was to get super strong and be able to use that strength to do good in the world. I kind of achieved that. Um, but another dream of mine is, uh, of course, because I'm not a superhero, um, I'm going to die at some point. <laughs> and, and that means that I'm working towards uh, that point, which means I'm going to age. So as an athlete, of course, uh, you know, age is a factor. Even as a vegan, you still, you know, age still touches you. <laughs> so, um, so I always knew um, there is only a limited time where I can, you know, use my, uh, use my work as an athlete as, as a way of activism, because at some point, age won't allow me to, you know, get better than, than I was. And, and I'm very competitive uh, uh, in, in my mindset as an athlete in a way that, I'm not really competitive when it comes to competing with others, but I'm insanely competitive when it comes to measuring myself with myself. So it's it's very frustrating for me when when I uh, at, at some point kind of had to come come to grips with the fact that age will stop me at some point. I, I will not indefinitely be able to get better and better and stronger and stronger. Um, and um, so that's the reason why I also retired in 2016. So, but, but that second dream of mine has always been because of, you know, the fact that I can't do this forever to find someone. Um, because another thing that I have to say is like, I'm not, um, I don't have the best genetics or the best, you know, anatomy for a strongman. Like uh, when you, when you look at strongmen, they're usually, uh, usually huge guys. Uh, some of them are like, um, you know, um, in, in, in feet, uh, I don't even know uh, what, what it is, but six foot four, six foot six. Yeah, it, I mean, some of them go go towards uh, like almost seven. Yeah. Uh, so, um, like in meters, uh, there's there's guys like Brian Shaw, for instance, who is two meters and ten, or the mountain uh, Thor Bjornsson. Um, he's two meters and ten, and and they, some sometimes they weigh like around two hundred kilos, which is crazy. Uh, and I'm just. Um, what is uh, in feet? I'm um, I think five 
seven, I think. I'm five. I think I'm five seven. So uh, I'm not sure. 170 centimeters is, is um, in the, the metric <laughs> number. So um, so I'm a dwarf, you know, uh, between those guys. Um, and um, so the only reason I've been even able to to compete with them has been that the one thing that I really have is an iron will. Like um, it's it's really hard if I put something. Uh, um, you know, if, if I if I have something that, that I put my mind to it, it's really hard to stop me. Like it's it's uh, because, and I think that has a lot to do with my childhood. Uh, because as a, as a child, you know, there, there was all this stuff that I had to kind of uh, you know struggle with, and then I had to get through. So that really uh, taught me to to you know, how to face adversity and how to be able to overcome challenges. So that is something where um, I. In a lot of cases, um, I've been able to compete with with guys who physically um, I shouldn't be able to beat. But you know, when it comes to strongman competition, sometimes you just you know you have an injury while you're competing, but the competition isn't over. So then it becomes about okay, are are you still going to go for it when you're when you when your hands are completely torn and and you're bleeding, but there is still you know. Uh, for instance, with the farmer's walk, you still have to go another 20 meters. You still have to go another 60 feet, and and your your hands are bleeding. So so the question is, are you going to grab, you know, with those bloody hands, and are you going to, you know, finish the job, or are you just going to back off? Um, and sometimes it's been just that, you know, insane de um, determination that uh, has given me basically a chance against uh, these much bigger guys. Um, and especially when I then went vegan, that determination get, got even way bigger because uh, I knew like well, before I went vegan, I was really competing just to win and, and kind of for the glory of, of all of it. Um, but then when I went vegan, I felt like there was this huge responsibility that I was feeling because I knew that people were using me as an example um, to say, OK, you can be strong and you can compete against the strongest. And you don't have to consume animal products. You don't have to hurt, uh, you know, a sentient living being. So uh, in order to do that. So I felt this pressure uh, on myself to, you know, just not let the animals down, uh, if, if you want to, you know, say it that, um, directly like that. So, so my determination was even bigger then. Um, so, but uh, what I'm trying to say with all that is, that um, I had this problem that that physically I was not really made to you know to to to, to be the best or to be competing against uh, against the best. I had the, uh, what it takes mentally, but I was just lacking just pure like uh, body mass uh, to be able to do that. And when you're um, when you're just uh, you know five seven, um, you know when you have a bigger guy who has a bigger frame. They can just put on more muscle, uh, um, and and you know uh, it's it's just impossible with a smaller frame to put on the same amount of muscle because at some point the extra body mass is going to just be in your way. And in strongman, we also have to be quick and we have to be able to move. So um, so it's I, the heaviest I was was 140 kilos, which is I think a little bit more or around 300 pounds. Uh, and for a short guy, guy like me. That that's that's pretty much like the limit. If if I had gotten any um, bigger than that, it would have just slowed me down. So, so there's really that much you can do about that. So it's always been my dream to find someone who doesn't have that you know physical kind of uh, handicap or handicap is, is not the right word, but but who is just physically more tailored for the sport. Let's let's put it that way. Um, and then be able to to help them uh, basically do what, what I was trying to do with the you know with what, whatever nature gave me right um, and it, it, right now I'm I can't talk about it because it's all private but I think I might have found the person to do it so um it's it's a lot of exciting stuff happening right now <laughs> that is exciting Patrick and I, I noticed myself nodding so much with what you're saying, because you and I have a lot more in common than probably people would think. Uh, 
in addition to all the wanting to be superhero and making a difference and having those as role models, whether they're fictitious characters or real, real people as role models and something to aspire to be, I relate completely. I mean, look at me on screen. I, I feel, especially next to you, I feel very narrow and small, yet I built my name and reputation in bodybuilding. That's a sport, Patrick, I had no business doing. I was built as a long distance runner. I, I ran collegiate uh, long distance cross country. I, I raced against, uh, you know, both, you know, mixed genders and a lot of like summertime races. And I placed ahead of multiple uh, female um, Olympic medalists and, and world record uh, competitors or, or record holders. Um, Maria Mutola, Mary Decker Slaney, some of those kind of athletes in my native home, Oregon. I, running was something that I was really good at. You know, bodybuilding was something that I, I had that same thing, that iron will. Like, I am going to make a difference and show people that I can build muscle without eating animals, without harming animals. And I did. I put on 100 pounds, from 120 pounds to 220 pounds at my peak. And like you, I'm actually sitting here right now with a, with a sore back. You know, I'm in that, I think we're the same age. I'm 42. You're about the same? 43. Yeah, exactly. We're the same age. I'm getting to a point too. I retired many years ago, a little bit before you did. And I've transitioned to writing books. I know you've written books. We'll talk about that in a little bit. And, and your comic book, I definitely want to talk about that. But I'm in the same boat as you, Patrick. Like I'm, you know, in my 40s now, my back has taken, you know, 20 something years of lifting, uh, the stress on my lower back. And I think a lot of people listening can relate to a lot of people now in their 40s, 50s, 60s. And our, our, our time as athletes is, you know, unfortunately for like setting records and being our personal best is, is kind of dwindling. And that the psychological aspect of that is difficult. It has been for me, I'm sure it has been for you. Uh, you're actually a psychologist. I'm sure you could, uh, you help me and many others through that. <laughs> uh, <laughs> So I, I want to ask you a couple things. Um, first of all, uh, I don't know if we've explicitly explained, uh, aside from wanting to save the world and, and make the world a better place, like, was there one specific thing, like a, a catalyst that said, okay, I'm already uh, Germany's strongest man, at least for that particular year and in your, in your particular weight class. And I'm already competing with these, these strongman competitors, some of the best in the world. Why? become vegan at that point, what was that catalyst for you? And how did that impact your training? And then how did that impact your diet? Like what were you eating? And then what did you eat instead? Yeah, so I, I was vegetarian for six years before I went vegan. Uh, and it was, as, as you uh, correctly explained, it was exactly after winning the title. So I had basically reached the point where I was on, on the pinnacle of my career until that point I had just won uh, the heavyweight nationals um, I had actually won the, uh, the the German championships in lightweight for two years in 2007 and 2009 uh, and in Germany the heavyweights and the lightweights uh, basically compete at the same competition uh, in strongman so that means that uh, at the end of the competition as a lightweight you always have a placing in your division and then you have an overall placing where you compare yourself to the heavyweights as well um, and every time that I won as a lightweight, I was also fifth overall. So only four of the heavier guys were actually stronger. Um, and that was the reason why in 2010, so one year uh, before going vegan, um, I decided to switch to heavyweights because I thought, well, if I don't have to stay within the weight limit, which was 105 kilos. Uh, and for me at that point, it was like I was already starting to feel like uh, it was holding me back. So I thought if I'm able to get a little bit heavier, who knows, maybe I can do in the, uh, well in the heavyweights as well. Um, so I became runner-up champion in 2010. And then in 2011, I won the title. And the catalyst was basically winning the title because what that did is, um, so I was vegetarian at that point, And that was kind of, uh, it started a whole media craze here in Germany. And then it, it got, it swept even over to international outlets because people were like super surprised that a guy who doesn't eat any meat is able to succeed in this sport where you think like they're eating half a cow a day. So, uh, so, so it was, you know, it, it was kind of going uh, against people's intuition. So uh, there was a lot of media interest to kind of, you know, sell that story. Um, and what, what that made me realize is that because when I went vegetarian, it was for ethical reasons. 
but um, it was just a private decision. I, I was not, uh, you know, planning to become an activist or anything. And really, I was a vegetarian for six years, and I wasn't an activist. Like uh, at, at competitions, I would always tell everyone that I'm vegetarian because I was kind of, you know, I was outspoken about it, but I was never thinking that I would, you know, achieve, you know, anything outside of what I was doing for my own life, basically being vegetarian. Uh, but when uh, when I won the title and I got all that media attention, what I realized is that all of a sudden people were actually sending me feedback and telling me that for them I was kind of a role model or you know an inspiration to you know um, to and it was two different things. So the one thing was some people were uh, basically telling me that I opened their eyes on the fact that you you know you can be strong without eating any meat. So that was one group. And then the other group was actually guys who emotionally felt the same way. Like they were compassionate uh, um, guys in, 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 a, in a young age, uh, basically in the age, you know, the coming of age kind of, kind of uh, age group where um, they were telling me that um, for them, uh, it, it was almost culturally liberating to have the strongest guy in the country talk about compassion talk about feelings that usually are not looked upon as manly or, you know, uh, what, whatever um, you, you would define as masculine uh, back in the day, like we're talking a decade ago. The, the world has changed a little bit in, the, in those 10 years. Uh, and I think that's for the better of it. <laughs> so, um, so, so I felt like I had this much bigger responsibility all, uh, all of a sudden because this wasn't a... Uh, a private thing anymore. I was influencing other people, basically. Um, and that was really, for me, the point where I said, okay, I know that coming from an ethical point of view, uh, being vegetarian doesn't really cut it because I'm still consuming dairy. I'm still consuming... Um, I wasn't, you know, the, my egg consumption was already minimal. I wasn't buying any eggs, but I was consuming products where you have eggs in them. So um, so I knew that all of that was not in line with uh, my idea that I wanted to just reduce animal suffering and not contribute to it. I knew I was still contributing to it. Uh, and it, it actually gave me a hard time to get a lot of praise from people because I felt like I don't deserve that praise because I'm not really doing what I could do. You know, I, I knew being vegan would actually be the answer. And I, and I felt like, oh, this this feels awkward to, you know, to 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 get all this attention and all this praise. So that was really what pushed me to, to the point where I said, okay, I want to be vegan. Um, but I was really terrified, to be honest. Because because uh, when I went vegetarian six years before that, it was really easy for me. I never really liked meat. Uh, actually, as a child, they kind of had to force it on me. So um, I, I was eating a lot of meat before as a protein source and because everybody was telling me you have to. Um, but, uh, but then um, stopping uh, with that was really easy for me. But uh, it was a completely different story with dairy because um, since my childhood, I've been like... Um, consuming tons of you know milk cow's milk um and i felt like that, especially after going vegetarian that was my main staple for as, as a protein source so i felt like um you know i wasn't sure if if i would be able to um to maintain my my performance level uh, and that was of course particularly scary because as i said i was kind of at the pinnacle of my career so I felt like, okay, I want to prove that you can be vegan and do the same thing that I'm doing now. But all the, if, if I have all the, um, uh, you know, the, the spotlight basically on me and I fail, I'm going to prove the opposite. So that's not going to help anyone. So that was one worry. Another worry was that I just didn't know if I would be uh, able to uh, endure basically the, the urge to go back to my dairy consumption. Um, so there was all this stuff in my head, but then at some point I just thought, look, you, you would have, if, if somebody had told you that you would become the strongest man in Germany, you would have laughed at them a few years ago. So you, if you, if you can do that, you should be able to make that work as a vegan too. So like, I, I felt like I, I, I was optimistic enough. Uh, in, in believing in myself uh, that, that I thought, okay, I'm going to make it work somehow. And I should also um, um, maybe mention one of my problems was also that 
within strongman like i knew that that you existed for instance i knew that uh alexander dagats for instance he he was vegan long before me so i knew there were some vegan bodybuilders and, and some vegan you know um the strength athletes in in the in the um uh, in the wider sense but specifically in strongman there was really no one uh, on an international level so i thought like is it possible if nobody is doing it um, and that actually became like a huge driving force after I did it and it worked so well. And like, uh, the health benefits were like, just, just came within weeks where I felt my recovery was getting better. My, my joint pain was going down because the inflammation levels were going, were going down. Um, my blood pressure actually went down, which for a strong man is something that can save your life. Basically, um, you know, a lot of the bigger guys have to take, um, um, you know, uh, blood pressure medicine and stuff. So um, it, it, there was so much good stuff happening. And then on the long run, I basically was able to become stronger and stronger for the next consecutive five years. So 2016 was when, when I retired. And that was when, when I was really strongest. And that's half a decade into being vegan. So, uh, so when I felt all of that, I just kind of uh, felt like... Um, that I had the responsibility to become that guy who makes it easier for others. Because I felt like I would have probably went much earlier from vegetarian to vegan if there would have been a guy on my level or, or above who had done it at some point so that I could know, so that I would know it, it actually works. Um, and then I felt like, okay, because I was at that spot basically um, uh, at that time and I had all that attention, I felt like, okay, I am that guy. I am that guy for the next generation, basically. And that's part of that dream where, where I felt like, okay, if, I, if I'm if i going to retire at some point, I have to find some, someone or a lot of people who are basically going to um, gonna do this thing uh, when, when, when I'm not competing anymore. Well, it's important that you you paved the way for that. Uh, I've heard a lot of the same, you know, with in the vegan bodybuilding world. I was never the best at it. I, I, like you, I didn't have the frame for it. And then along came guys like Tori Washington, Nimai Delgado, you know, better genetics, better frame, um, better fit for the, for the role. And, and they're doing it. So I have to, I have, I have to uh, tell you something. You're just too tall like <laughs> as, as a bodybuilder. And the, the, most of the, most of the really successful or like, like the super high level bodybuilders, they, they are my size basically. So, so you're just, you're just way too tall. So it's, it's not like, there's nothing wrong. It's it's basically the opposite problem that I had. I was too short for strongman, but uh, I, I actually have done bodybuilding as well. Yes, but, I do. Um, yeah, uh, but but uh, and for bodybuilding, my my build is actually okay and actually great. But um, you you have the 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 inverted problem basically. You're just way too tall actually for uh, for a bodybuilder, which which means you have to pack a ton of. Uh, a ton of muscle so that you get the same propor uh, proportion so don't right. don't believe yourself yeah you, um, i've seen i've seen some material where it is if if you know what it takes to look like that as a tall guy uh, you've been doing pretty well and 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 uh, the guys that you um, that you mentioned like nimai and, and and tori they're just a lot shorter than you are <laughs> and that's that's the reason why it looks uh, absolutely you know it looks different um well, and and I have that. I have that too. Like a lot of people, when they meet me in real life, because on photos you don't you don't see how short or tall somebody really is. So if they meet me in real life, they're sometimes surprised that I'm way shorter than they think. <laughs> well, we've both had some uphill climbs in that regard, where our passion didn't always fit what our genetic build was for. And we actually finally got a chance to meet at the Game Changers premiere in 2019 in Los Angeles. I think that was the first time we met after missing each other, sometimes by a day or by a year and all these major cities around the world speaking. But Patrick, we still didn't get to hear what you eat. So what, yeah. what do you eat as like, like it's different. A lot of people listening are not strong men or strong women. Um, we learned a little bit about it. You're, you're carrying very heavy items. It's so it's different than than bodybuilding where you're you're flexing and you're being judged based on your muscle size and symmetry and balance and conditioning and this aesthetic thing strong man or strong woman is how much can you lift how much can you pull how much can you carry how much can you press it's it's your physical strength being measured how much can you log press a log over your head uh 
so for those listening, that might be really enlightening. Like it's, this takes incredible amount of brute strength, physical strength. What do you eat as a vegan strongman, especially you were weighing nearly 300 pounds. What do you eat to fuel that kind of performance? So it's, it's kind of funny because the way that, that I eat hasn't really changed a lot. So uh, when I went vegetarian, um, I just replaced most of the, um, most of the uh, meat basically with dairy. Um, so, so that was that. But then when I went vegan, uh, I had to replace, of course, all the animal protein with, uh, with um, you know, 100% plant protein, which in the beginning I did in a terrible way by just replacing everything with soy. It, it worked, but it was, of course, um, nowhere near um, um, perfect. So <laughs> I, I improved upon that uh, quite, a, uh, quite a lot since then. But um, one thing that I've done basically throughout my career um, in, in, in Strongman and even before that is um, that I've actually got a lot of my calories in liquid form. And as a Strongman, that is something that is really helpful because, um, you know, the, the, at least the heavyweight guys, I mean, it depends when you have the lighter, like um, lightweight uh, to 100, 105 kilos, um, that's, that's guys who can eat relatively normally, like uh, maybe a bodybuilder would too. Um, but uh, the heavyweight guys, because they're so tall and because, you know, uh, they are so heavy, uh, they need tons of calories like they they eat a lot uh, and and to be able to compete with that of course i had to kind of you know go uh, at least uh, near to that level so the highest consumption of calories that i had was 7000 calories a day um which is you know still uh, lower than you know some of those giants who sometimes go to like 10000 calories or something like that at least that's what they say in public and sometimes i'm thinking Maybe they just like maybe they kind of blow blow that number up a little bit because ten thousand just seems so ridiculous. But uh, I don't know. Maybe maybe it's real. So um, so so my highest point was basically seven thousand calories a day. Um, and then when it comes to the protein sources themselves, um, soy is a great source if you if you're basically going for for a mono. Um, um, protein source that is already like you know has a great amino acid profile and everything um so um, that's why it was the first thing that uh, i started with when when i switched because i wanted to make sure that you know um um that i don't experiment too much in the beginning i, I just wanted to go the safe way so so to say and then later on i started experimenting with other uh, stuff um and then uh and then it's just legumes and, and, and grains, really. It's um, rice dishes mostly because I'm uh, pretty influenced by, you know, by, by what I was eating as a child, uh, you know, and, and what my mom would cook. And that's a lot of Persian dishes because, you know, that's, that's where I grew up. Um, and um, I also like Indian uh, uh, cuisine and, and uh, generally uh, Eastern cuisine, like Chinese uh, food and so on. So... I was I was basically as a vegan I'm I'm still eating pretty much the same dishes it's just I uh, I replaced the meat with uh, you know just just with uh, plant uh, sources like tofu or tempeh or just some meat replacement or something and uh, but um, just just apart from that it's really the same dishes that I'm uh, still eating and then when my appetite is uh, basically um, w when I'm satiated uh, I just drink the rest of the calories that I need um, to, you know, to, to get those extra calories. Uh, but I have to say that is when I was competing. So, and I think that's what, what interests people most, because now that I'm retired, I'm, I think I'm eating pretty normally. I think I'm eating like around maybe half of those calories. Uh, I still get, get a lot of them uh, in liquid form, but that's more be, uh, for, for practical reasons. Um, it's like, I'm trying to hit around uh, six meals a day. And then half of those meals are uh, are solid, and half of them are liquid. And that's just because um, you know when, when I'm working or when I'm outside of the house, it's just more practical to just have something you know as a shake or a smoothie or something with you that you can then uh, have as as a meal instead of you know sitting down and you know eating something solid for six times a day. Right, and I think that's one thing that a lot of people don't understand. People who are in the general plant-based diet world or whole food plant-based diet world and they're not athletes or they're not 
extreme athletes or they're certainly not bodybuilders or strong men or NFL football players. It's hard sometimes for people to understand, like, what do you mean you drink all your calories? Well, like you said, <laughs> David Carter played in the NFL as a vegan and would eat a 10,000 calorie diet. He is, what is he like six foot four, you know, really tall, 300 pounds, explosive, fast. And he would have to drink smoothies. And these are smoothies sometimes with with beans, you know, white beans in them, with yeah. avocado, with all kinds of these calorie dense, nutrient rich foods that are going to pack on calories. Because th that's one thing that I think the general public doesn't always understand is that bodybuilders, strong men, strong women, they're not your typical normal uh, individual. You're just not. It, it requires a different type of diet, requires a different type of training. You go through things that are uh, are difficult and what the general public just wouldn't put themselves through. And I want to ask about that for a minute. So thank you for sharing about the diet. But I also want to ask you about the training for strong men. I mean, or strong man. I mean, do you? What are the possibilities or the side effects of of potential injury from these incredibly heavy lifts? Uh, what's recovery like? I mean, it's one thing. I mean, I was, you know, I, I've been at the gym all week. I do a little, you know, curls and some presses, you know, I'm retired now and I kind of keep trying to keep it safe, but you're lifting like heavy stones above your head. Logs. Yep. I, I, you were throwing uh, washing machines, like mm -hmm. a big washing machine that people will do their laundry and you pick that up and throw it. You push cars over. <laughs> I mean, what is the toll on your spine, on your muscles? not just you, but for others in that sport, is that a difficult thing you're up against? And what do you do to help with recovery? Is it, a, is it diet? Is it um, anti-inflammatory supplements? Is it uh, sports massage therapy, you know, um, steam room, a hot tub, sauna? Like, how do you deal with that? Because with my back, my sore back from years of lifting, I can't even imagine picking up a cooler off the ground, let alone a washing machine. Yeah. Yeah. It, it's really all the above. Um, and so recovery, as you said, is, is, it is really, really important in, in strongman because one of the uh, problems is that uh, as a bodybuilder, you have basically uh, a split. So that means that, you know, every time you go to a gym, you have a certain amount of, uh, you know, a certain number of muscles that you train and the rest of your muscles can rest in that time, right? So as a strongman, almost every lift somehow involves pretty much the whole body so it's uh, like you know, when when you're competing and when you're actually uh, you know training all those uh, different events it's almost impossible to you know get any rest uh, basically for for the muscles who uh, normally you would you know uh, rest in in a normal split or something like that so that means that recovery gets so much, it, it becomes the limiting factor really it's recovery and how much calories can you deliver? Uh, you, I shouldn't say calories, how much nutrients can you deliver to your body? That's why uh, diet uh, is also such a huge factor in strongman. And, and I think that's also a reason why a lot of the athletes uh, almost become, and that's something in bodybuilding too, where athletes almost become kind of um, paranoid to, I could miss a protein shake or I could miss, you know, uh, something there and it, I, I would become catabolic. So that is something that, that uh, goes in, in bodybuilding circles and also in strongman is the same thing. Although in strongman is not as much about the uh, uh, protein. It's more like, uh, am I eating enough? Am I getting enough calories? So um, with the recovery, um, I actually have to say uh, in, in hindsight, um, I should have probably done more. Um, so I've been always someone who, um, like I've, I've been training very, very hard. And I think I've been actually limiting myself because um, I would usually only use recovery if I would have to. Like, you know, um, uh, for instance, with the massages, that is something that can really help you, you know, uh, overcome soreness and uh, get, get the muscle basically, um, you know, smooth enough uh, so that you can train, um, um, you know, earlier than, than you would normally be able to. And, and there are a lot of methods that, that you can use. Um, and I was really, I, I have to say, I was really lazy on that front. So I could have probably done way more than I did. I would only go to a massage uh, therapist uh, or, or a physiotherapist if somebody was broken. Like <laughs> if I had to fix something, then I would go and tell them like, okay, this is the mess that I, that I made. Now, pre please kind of, you know, help me with it. 
Um, and that brings me to the next point. Yes, um, strong men generally are very injury prone. Um, the one factor is just that a lot of the disciplines um, you're moving with huge weight. And that means there is, and also what people may may not uh, realize is that um, in, in a lot of those events, it's about speed actually. So uh, of course you have to be strong to move those weights, but you're actually competing against other athletes and you have to be the fastest. You're right. competing against the clock basically. So what that means is that it you have a huge um, um, incentive to, um, you know, to, to hurry through those movements, which can of course lead to, uh, to, to accidents. So, um, you know, in, in competition, I think one of the biggest factors is really that uh, why trying to be as fast as you can, that, that you, you know, have a misstep or something and then something, um, sometimes terrible stuff happens, like somebody just breaks their leg or uh, some, some crazy stuff. And then uh, breaking your leg is terrible enough, but if you if if you're carrying something that is like 180 kilos, like 400 pounds, and you're carrying that and you break your leg doing that, uh, in the worst case, you, that just smashes uh, on you. So, so it's it, it's pretty cr uh, crazy. So it is as as insane as it looks on TV. Uh, so, so that's one thing. Um, and uh, then the other thing is just the overall tall that you know, doing that for decades. Like for me, I've been training strength sports for pretty much three decades now. So um, you have a lot of accumulative damage that you, you know, that you gather in, in all those years. Um, so um, yeah, that is also something that, uh, you know, with age, you you feel more than when you were younger. Like when I had a lot of uh, minor and, and some bigger injuries uh, in, in the course of my career. Uh, and when they happened, uh, it like it it, it 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 wasn't that bad. So I recovered from them, and then the life goes on. Uh, but today, um, you know, um, if I'm not careful, I get reminded uh, of all of them, like on a daily basis. If I do something wrong, then uh, I have like three pec injuries, uh, three little pec tears that I feel. Uh, my my uh, tricep was torn. Uh, I tore my calf um, actually three weeks before I won uh, Germany's Strongest Man. That is uh, that is probably uh, the the funniest part of or the inter most interesting part of the story that most people don't even know is that um, um, we we had qualifier competitions uh, prior to the finals uh, for for Germany's Strongest Man, uh, and the last qualifier um, I tore my calf, and that was three weeks before before the finals. Um, so when I went into the finals, uh, it was just three days before the competition, where I, for the first time, I was able to even roll my my foot, my my right foot, where where I had the injury. I was able to roll it, um, so I was I was basically uh, barely able to walk. Um, and and then you have you know these things like, um, for instance, we we had we had a, a thing where it's called the wheelbarrow, and you know, as uh, as as the name says, you you're basically carrying something very heavy with a wheelbarrow. In this case, it was uh, a car. So you you're carrying basically a car, and you try to run as fast as you can, uh, and and then do that with a with a torn calf, uh, where you know three days ago that was the first time where you could even do a normal step, um, and I tore it again during the competition. So so um, I was my my goal was. That, so, so that was what, what made the win actually to totally crazy because my main goal for the competition was just survive, just survive the competition uh, because um, I, I, you know, I, I refuse to give up. As I said, I'm pretty insane when it comes to that. Like, you cannot stop me. If, if, if things break, I just, as long as I have two limbs, uh, the, you know, two legs and, and, and two arms, I'm going to still go on. So, so I just wanted to survive the thing. Uh, and when it came to to the last um, to the last event, I was on um, second place, uh, and there were four points between me and the guy who was leading. And the last event was the Atlas Stones. So we we already spoke about anatomy and how that's important. The Atlas Stones are pretty much one of the worst things for a shoulder guy because, you know, uh, one thing is uh, you have to uh, lift them on a platform. And if you are taller, that platform is not going to be as high for you 
as mm -hmm. uh, for someone who is shorter. So I have to lift it up uh, relatively higher than than a taller guy. But also, if you're short, you have short arms. So that means you can't grab it as like some of the taller guys. They can actually grab all the way like uh, um, um, around the, the 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 concrete ball, and they can actually then almost cross their fingers. Uh, and for me, it's like I'm I'm just at the sides of the thing, and right. somehow trying trying to get these things up. So it was it was actually impossible to make up those four points and somehow beat the other guy. And also the other guy was um, his name is Daniel Wild. Um, and um, for the stones was one of his better lifts. So he was one of the top guys in the stones. And there was only one time where I have beaten him in stones. And that was in the rain. For some reason, I don't know why, but for some reason, his technique didn't seem like, like he, he was just not doing well when the, when the stuff would get uh, wet. I mean, of course, that's bad for everyone. But for some reason... It, it appeared that my technique wasn't suffering in the rain, but his was. And when we went for it, it just started to, it, it just started to pour like, like crazy. So it started to rain and I actually beat him. Like he, he did terribly and I beat him so much uh, like uh, that, that I actually um, was able to make up those four points and win the competition. It was completely insane. <laughs> That that is crazy. And it's also super fascinating because I mean, this is probably the first time in the history of Chef AJ show that there people are learning about Atlas Stone and his strongman. This is just totally unique stuff. And I follow the sport. I've watched it on television uh, going back 10 or 20 years ago. Um, the metrics, you know, it was be on TV and and yeah. And I still don't know even all the different events and sports. So it's fascinating for me. Yeah. Um, a couple of things came to mind, Patrick, and I do want to ask you about a few more things, and then we'll finish with your uh, your comic book and your upcoming tour, because I know you're going to various parts of the country. I mean, the world. In fact, I'm envious of it. I was even almost like like jealously thinking, like, man, I hope he, maybe he can put in a good a good word for me. I want to go to some of these places in South America and around the world that you're going to. It's very exciting. But one thing that came to mind, just a, a random a random thing, was this. You were talking about all the the wear and tear in your body, the injuries, the pec, the calf, and I have my back. And and ironically, my back went out the the week before I, I won a bodybuilding competition, similar to yours, not as quite as dramatic, but the yeah. iron will to go on. And the same when I was a runner and and set a course record, I was suffering through that. But I think we're very much alike, where we're trying to do set an example, or we're trying to represent something else. We have this it's not a burden, but like you said, a responsibility to represent veganism in, in a way that we are going to suffer a little bit. And that's, that's a little bit altruistic, but it's a, it's a little bit honest and, and practical as well is that we are going to take a bit of a beating on our back, our calf, our pec, whatever, to say that, yes, you can, yes, you can do this without harming animals. And this is what I believe in. And I'm going to show you. And I think I, I, I'm just loving this, how much there's just so much I identify with. But what, one thing I, it reminded me of, there's, there's this uh, American country song by Garth Brooks. I think it was like one of his first big hits. It said, it said I'm much too young to feel this damn old. And uh, <laughs> guys like you and I, and not, not people listening, but people who have put themselves through a physical training period of three decades where we've got our things you know our shoulder our back whatever we did it for our love of sport our love of representing a cause that we care deeply about and now here we are in our 40s we both got the white in our beards and the in the wear and tear in our body and and, and sometimes you wake up and you're uh, you feel man i'm much too young to feel this damn old and it's just part of the the sports that we chose um so i want to also ask um, I want to respect time and everything, but I know lots of people listening are wondering, what was the impact? I mean, you had media buzz all around. How is this guy, Germany's strongest man, and arguably one of the strongest men on planet Earth out of 7 billion people at the time, how is this guy doing this on a, on a vegan, ethical vegan diet and lifestyle? What was the response from fellow competitors, um, the media? Did you inspire other people? Uh, during that time of, of competition, um, what was that response like? Yeah, I, I think, um, I, I feel like there was a lot of positive uh, feedback from 
from younger guys. Um, as, as I said in the, in the beginning, like uh, a lot of the positive feedback really came from younger guys um, for, for several reasons. Um, uh, but then uh, there was also um, like, it's interesting that you're asking uh, uh, for, for the athletes because there was there was a really mixed bag of, of reactions within the athletes because right. to them, it was just so crazy. Like, um, you know, I had this whole mental kind of thing where I went you know, within myself, and I kind of made that made that decision after thinking about it for a long time. And then when I made it public, um, of course, none of the none of the other athletes really kind of you know knew what my motivation is and, and so on. So um, I mean, some of the reactions were <laughs> straight up hostile. Like um, that, there was a part of them who just thought, okay, he's crazy now. Like he's He's gonna do it, but it's it's gonna probably completely destroy him. Um, and and I of course, uh, especially um, like it was a little bit late, more laid back and relaxed on an international level, but it was way more intense on a national level because. And I think the reason, like back then, I didn't understand, and I kind of uh, it frustrated me a little bit uh, also that I was actually getting a lot of negative reactions. But I think that was just connected to the fact that I was, I was uh, the title holder within my country so there was just all this attention from the other athletes because of course when you're in that position you're the guy to beat so everybody right. is kind of focusing on you uh and then when i said i wasn't go v and they just like half of them thought okay he's crazy and then the other half actually thought he must be lying they, they thought like okay he's holding the title why would he do that to himself so and then when all this media craze happened they felt like, oh, so it's a PR stunt. So he's doing that. So like, as if I I had, like, I had no idea that all that media circus would, ha would happen. Uh, but for them, it was like, oh, this was, this was a premeditated to the like, like move. And, and he just wanted to get more attention. So there was a lot of nonsense happening there on that front. But there's also like some really funny reactions um, that actually, I think, uh, bring it really to the point. Uh, and I want to tell you a little story. Um, so the, I was in 2012, that's one year into being vegan. Uh, I was at the world championships in China um, and it was a heavyweight uh, world championships and it went for, uh, it was a huge kind of TV uh, uh, show as well. Um, and like almost, it had some parts that are reminiscent of, of the reality the TV kind of uh, nonsense that was happening back in the day. So it was it was a ridiculous huge circus. So um, what, I, what I'm trying to say is that the, it was a 10 day competition. So all the athletes are together for 10 days in the same hotel, which means that every athlete can basically watch the other athletes eat. So that means they see what I'm eating. Like most of them just eat tons of meat and you know what you would expect uh, for, for a strong man to eat. And I'm sitting there, uh, in China, it's always terrible because, uh, like, they eat pretty much everything that doesn't run away uh, quick enough. <laughs> so that means that there's like, uh, like, like an insane number of meat options, uh, but um, sometimes very limited, uh, you know, plant-based options, especially when it comes to protein sources. Like, I don't even think that I saw a. I think that there was in, in those 10 days, there was probably one day or two where there was some tofu. So at least I had something with protein. Otherwise, I was just drinking shakes because most of the time I was just eating vegetables and, and rice. And there was not a lot of protein in that. So I'm sitting there um, for all those days and I'm eating you know, my, my, my vegan food. And I realized that from day one on, there was, uh, his name is Daini Sigeris. He's an athlete from, uh, I think it's Latvia. Um, and he's like, he's always sitting somewhere where he has an eye on me. And I feel like, man, this guy is, he's, he's watching me. Like he's legit sitting there and, 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 and watching me all the time with every meal. And then after four days, and it was weird. I didn't want to kind of, uh, um, 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 you know, I, I didn't want to say anything because, uh, I didn't want to feel like I, I, I had a problem with it, but at the same time, it was kind of making me think like, why is he watching me? So after four days, he comes over and asks me if he can sit at the table. And I'm like, of course. <laughs> so he sits there and tells me, look, 
I've been watching you. <laughs> I say, oh yeah, I know. <laughs> so he said, okay, um, so I saw that you're not eating any meat, right? And I say, yeah, I'm, I'm vegan. I, I don't eat any animal products. And he says, okay, but now tell me the truth. I said, okay, I'm going to tell you the, the, the honest truth. He says, when you go up to your, to your hotel room, that's when you eat your steak, right? <laughs> I had to laugh so hard. But I think that really brings it to the point. Like for the other athletes, it was just unimaginable that, um, you know, what, what I was doing would work and right. you, then you can survive it. Of course, now the situation is a little bit different. <laughs> it was also funny because that was in 2012. And the next time that I made uh, Dynast was um, actually the last competition in my, uh, uh, in my career. That's when I, when I tore my tricep. That was in 2016 at the Log Lifting World Championships uh, in, uh, in Lithuania. Um, and I meet this guy again, and uh, I'm, um, we, we, had a, we had a rental car, so I'm, I'm parking at the parking lot. I want to go up to the hotel room, and this guy comes over and uh, gets out of his car, and he's, he's screaming, like, uh, <laughs> towards, towards uh, I don't know, like, uh, all over the whole parking lot. Like, he's screaming, ah, oh, there is this freaking vegan again. And he's, <laughs> are, are you still doing that crazy thing? <laughs> And I say, yeah, I'm still vegan. And then comes a, a Lithuanian guy uh, around the corner and raises his fist and says, yeah, the vegan badass, vegan power. <laughs> Titus was completely flabbergasted because I think like in, he, he didn't really expect to, you know, to have some vegans come around the corner in, in Lithuania at that point. But I think that, <laughs> that kind of shows that a lot has changed within those 10 years. And today, um, you know, there's there's really a lot of uh, strength athletes doing it out there, and I'm really happy that that it's happening. It just has to start happening in strongman too. Yeah, now there's a lot of believers. Uh, 10, 15, 20, 25 years ago, a lot of non-believers, and in fact, you might recognize this as well. When I became vegan 27 years ago, that there was concern over my health. Um, I understand. Yeah. I understand, Robert. You care about animals. This is even coming from my parents, including my father, who's a, a PhD animal science professor emeritus at you know at a university, who is concerned for over my health. You fast forward 25 years later. Now people say, "What do they say?" Oh, I know I should go vegan for my health. I know I should go yeah. plant based for my health. I and mean, the complete shift, 180 over the last yeah. couple of decades. And and you've been a big part of that, Patrick. Um, before we wrap up and talk about Earthraiser and your upcoming tours and all that, I would be remiss if I didn't mention this. Uh, my 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 uh, my wife's family told me to mention this to you. Um, you're Armenian. Uh, my yeah. father-in-law is Armenian. Uh, oh. he's, got, he's got the last name Camion, and and so uh, he wanted me to tell you that. And uh, and I also just want to acknowledge and recognize just the incredible work that you do, Patrick, and the fact that you did carve out a, a, a place in Vegan Strongman that, that no one had done before you. And what that did was inspire an entire generation of, of people who are interested in that sport. And not just people who are interested in that sport, but people who know your name as one of the world's strongest men. And whether you get called the, the world's strongest man, I know it gets technical, like the actual titles, or Germany's strongest man, or you get referenced all the time. When I tour, I hear it. When I, I online, I see it. When I write books, do podcasts, your name comes up all the time. And I think that speaks volumes to the impact that you've made on this planet, which is something that you set out to do a long time ago. So I want to kind of wrap up and finish with... Um, three things. Um, one, uh, and I'll say these in order and then you can answer them whatever order you want, but what's something that most people don't know about you? Give you a moment to think about that. And uh, tell us about Earthraiser, your, your comic, which may get, you know, get turned into a film and, and so many other things. And also uh, tell us where we might be able to catch you on your speaking tour and what are some of the, the primary themes that you talk about in those talks that you do around the globe. So uh, take it from there, Patrick. <laughs> um, okay, I, I, start, I start in the, in the order of, of the questions, uh, okay. the, the same order you asked them. So that, that makes it easier for me. So I think there's actually a ton of stuff that people don't know about me. It's really hard to single out something um, because, because I, so 
one dream of me and uh, of mine has always uh, also been to um but, but it was kind of a a dream that i never really set out to um to to make true because it always felt like a dream and never, never felt like something that is more uh, kind of um you know solid enough um has been to be an actor but but not uh, for the reason that that a lot of people might have if for me it was really i'm once you know me <laughs> It feels like I'm actually like three person put together in one body. Like, uh, but but it's not a split personality. I just have so many interests that don't have to do uh, with with each other. Like, for instance, I think a lot of people might not know that I'm actually uh, like I've, I've I've been a gamer uh, throughout most of most of my life. But that's like back in the day where it wasn't normal to be a gamer. Like I was like one of two of us uh, in in the whole school or so. Uh, and I've actually grown up with, you know, with, with the old school Atari kind of Pong and all that stuff. So that's been a huge part of my life. At some point, um, I've I've been a gothic. Like, <laughs> so, I did not know that. Yeah, yeah. There's there's actually a lot of those things that, um, and then and then also, um, um, I think, um, depending on from which angle people get to know me. They probably have a completely different um, and 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 not really correct idea of how you know how I am personality wise. Like for instance, if you only know me as an um, as an activist, a lot of people think that I'm a very like a very uh, kind of um, you know I'm trying to be the soft spoken kind of kind person, right? But um, I had really really wild parts of my life where I had a lot of contact with. Um, you know, I've been before I uh, started to study. Uh, I've been actually a bouncer for for seven years, and I've been in contact with some terrible, terrible people. And uh, there has been like some wild as aspects um, that that would probably shock a lot of people who think that I'm this teddy bear. You know, <laughs> <laughs> so so it is it is kind of funny. So uh, I, sometimes I, I feel like, and I think the reason for you know being fascinated with acting is. Because I always felt like life just doesn't give me enough room to to basically experience all the different stuff that that I'm that I'm interested in, and as as an actor, you can basically <laughs> reinvent yourself and become a different person, and yeah. that is still to this day really fascinating to me because I feel like there's so much more stuff that I want to try and I want to go into that mindset and 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 in, into that mental place of being a you know being a completely different person. So. That's probably something that not a lot of people know about me. Um, and then, uh, what was the second one? <laughs> Earthraiser. 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 Yeah. Let me, let me let me just grab it. This is Earthraiser. <laughs> so there we go. I think we have a little bit of glare here. Um, so yeah, this is the uh, this is the hardcover version of Earthraiser. The idea with Earthraiser was um, so. When I retired, um, I I started to think about what I could do to um, to continue my work as an activist after um, not being an athlete anymore. So um, um, so and, and it started maybe even before I retired. So I was you know looking into different things. Um, and and one thing, as I said, I, um. um being an act, uh, being uh, an actor was was one of my fascinations. So I thought about, would it be possible? And this is when when we were actually making the game changers. Um, and I was thinking, so there are all these documentaries, and the game changers has has been pretty much like the most impactful thing that I've ever done in my whole life. But while we were doing it, I was thinking, okay, there's a documentary can only go that far in influencing people because unfortunately as a species we're hardwired in a way um, that we don't necessarily get influenced by information as much as we get through stories because our brain just has evolved like you know ancestrally uh, we've been uh, basically giving information for, for from generation to generation uh, by storytelling throughout like thousands of years so that's the way our, our brains really operate so i was thinking it's great that there are all these documentaries and the game changer is going to be an awesome one but what about making a film that has the the um 
that, that, that it has the goal to influence people in a positive way and, and kind of make them uh, see the perspective of the animal. Like that, that was my thing. So I was, and of course, my fascination with superheroes then brought me to a point where I, where I felt like, okay, I want to have this supernatural being. Um, and for some reason, he should be able to represent the animals. So first I was thinking about, you know, um, 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 an individual who could maybe communicate with the animals. And then I felt well, that's kind of Dr. Doolittle. So um, that's already been done. And uh, I also didn't feel like it, 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 it had the kind of the, the, the power and the impact that I wanted to have. Um, and then was, it was really when I came back from the US uh, and I had, um, I was in a hotel and we were uh, shooting for, uh, for a commercial uh, that I was a part of. I was totally jet lagged. I'm, uh, I'm in the hotel room, I can't sleep. So my brain just goes wild with ideas and stuff. Uh, and that was the moment where uh, it just clicked. Uh, and I thought, wait a second, he doesn't have to communicate with the animals. What if for some reason, this guy starts to feel everything that the animals feel? Mm -hmm. Like if he goes and, and, and walks by a slaughterhouse, it, for him, it feels like he is being slaughtered. Uh, and then, um, and, and then I thought, okay, but this is going to be like, if you feel like every few seconds you're being slaughtered, that's going to be unbearable. That's going to be too much pain for us, for the, psy the psyche to, to, to handle. So I thought there, there could be this breaking point where his, you know, his, his mind can take it anymore. And that, that triggers a transformation, uh, because I wanted to make a superhero. So there, there needed to be some kind of, um, you know, some, some flashy kind of effect, effect based things. So I thought, okay, what if he transforms basically into a berserker, something like the Hulk or something like a werewolf or something like that, um, when the pain just gets too much. And then he destroys everything that causes the pain. Because, you know, feeling the pain is one thing, but I want the hero to be, you know, to be, to have a good reason to destroy the slaughterhouse. And of course, as a human being, um, I mean, we all probably feel uh, that we would like to, you know, <laughs> to kind of kind of demolish a, a slaughterhouse, but it, it it wouldn't be the responsible thing to do. But if you are in some kind of berserk rate, it would probably be understandable <laughs> on an ethical uh, uh, basis. So, so that 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 was basically when when Earthraiser um, was was born, and and the idea of. Um, originally was to it, it was a film idea so i wanted to make a film basically based on that um and then i thought well um i, I really like the idea and i thought it's really powerful but i felt like i've never made a film nobody's going to give me enough money to make this film like nobody's going to trust the guy who has you know uh, no proof of concept and and no proof that he can actually pull this off so i felt like making this as a comic book would be the, the perfect first step uh, and then we had a Kickstarter campaign just to, you know, make the comic book. It was pretty successful in 2020. So that was right when the pandemic hit. So I was very, you know, busy at that time, just trying to, you know, finish the comic book and stuff. And then in early 2021, we we actually published the uh, the comic book. And it's, uh, but what I have to say is, unfortunately, because of the pandemic, there was also this whole logistics problem where you know um shipping was was i don't know if you had any contact with that but international shipping was basically impossible it, uh, the the um the rates got so expensive at some point where it didn't make like at least for a comic book it didn't make sense to send it to the states or uh, or uh, abroad so uh, that's why i uh, really uh, uh, were holding back on um on the marketing of the whole thing um, but but now this tour that I'm doing, which brings us to the to the third question, <laughs> um, is actually meant to kick off basically the actual marketing around the book as well. So I was in um, in um, Slovenia um, just last weekend, I think last weekend. Yeah, uh, I was in Slovenia. Um, so that was the the, the first one. Uh, it was really great because. I've been there five years ago, and I've been there actually ten years ago, uh, uh, competing even. So this was my third time there, and it's always good to uh, to be there. So that was a great start for um, you know for touring again. And then the next one is going to be in Canada, which is uh, I think in two weeks. 
um, I'm going to be at the VegFest in, in Winnipeg. And uh, so if, if anyone, uh, you know, uh, of, of uh, the, the listeners out there is uh, anywhere near the northern border of the U.S., I'm in Winnipeg uh, for the VegFest. <laughs> Um, and then uh, in, in late this year, in November, I'm going to be at the vegan camp out in, um, in Argentina, which um, it, for me, it's actually also huge because this is the first time that I've, I've been pretty much almost everywhere in the world uh, other than Australia and, um, and uh, um, Latin America. So uh, this is the first time I'm actually in Latin America. And uh, I think um, I'm really excited about this one. And you'll be there with Nimai too, as well, correct? Yeah, yeah, it's it's, it's cool uh, that uh, Nimai is also headlining the show. So um, I'm I'm really looking forward to uh, to meeting uh, Nimai again because um, it's I mean obviously he's, he's such a sweet guy and um, I've, I've met him a few times when I was in LA um, and we even trained together and stuff. So I think it's gonna be a good time to meet each other for a little bit more a prolonged time, basically, uh, in Argentina and. Uh, maybe he's he's going to also find some some good gyms that he can show me. <laughs> well, Patrick, I want to thank you so much for being on here during the Plant-Based Athlete Week or Cheek Week, as Chef AJ likes to call it. And and please get in touch. Let me know how I can help promote the comic book Earthraiser now that it's getting out there more. I'd be happy to do that to the best of my ability. And it was really a fascinating talk with you today, Patrick. Really an honor. And I learned so much and I know the listeners did too. And it was just... I just, I just think you're uh, an amazing individual and just such an outstanding example and representative of compassionate ethical veganism. And for that, Patrick, I thank you. Thanks, Robert. Thanks for having me. Thank you so much, Robert and Patrick. And you know, comic book or no comic book, I think you both are superheroes. And Patrick, I apologize for calling you the world's strongest man, but when I Googled it, it actually came up and I'm going to send you where the internet does say it. You know, if Google says it, it must be true. <laughs> So thank you so much. Yeah, no, no, it's fine. It's, it, that, that happens to me all the time. And that's uh, the, the reason that I'm uh, so um, kind of, um, um, that, that it's really important for me to say something is that because um, I, I don't want it to, to look like I'm, I'm kind of claiming titles that I don't have. It's really just an athlete's thing where I'm trying to be fair to, to the other athletes. So that's all. Would it be fair to say you're the world's strongest vegan man? Uh, yeah, I was actually I was calling myself that because I was called that for uh, for quite some time. I even named my uh, YouTube channel back then uh, to that. But I stopped doing that uh, when I when I retired because um, you know, as I said, there are other vegan strength athletes now, and uh, some of them are really not well known, but in, in incredibly impressive. So um, I think um, I'm, I'm always trying to do the thing that helps the cause most. So as a retired uh, strongman, I think it's it's not a good idea to call myself the world's strongest vegan because uh, at this stage, there are guys who are stronger than I am. Well, thank you so much for paving the way and for all you do for people and animals. <laughs> thank you. And thank you, Robert, for a wonderful interview. And thanks to all of you for watching another episode of Chef AJ Live. Please come back tomorrow for the final day of Cheat Week when Robert interviews another wonderful athlete. And I hear that there's a giveaway of a Breville, so you won't want to miss tomorrow's show. Thanks, everyone. Bye-bye.